Not long ago, these were all shiny and new, and probably somebody's pride and joy. Now look. For many cars here, this was the death sentence, a benign-sounding VT30, or the MOT failure form, signed by an MOT tester who pronounced sentence. But was the tester right? Could some of these cars have gone a few miles more, or perhaps even some should have failed earlier? Especially if they're rotten cars. Tin worm, ferrous oxide, rust, rot, call it what you will, but when it comes to MOT testing, corrosion is an area which for some testers can be confusing. Once the sign is up, the vehicle inspectorate wants it to stay there and the test station never to receive one of these, a contemplated withdrawal letter. The vehicle inspectorate gets hundreds of complaints per year involving vehicle corrosion. This comes in mainly from, from the testers who have particular problems when carrying out a test and members of the public. The standards are laid down in the MOT testers manual. This video is not a substitute for the manual, it is in addition to the manual to help testers arrive at the right decision. Failing cars that fall outside the standards just to be on the safe side is as serious as not failing defective vehicles. Getting it wrong has serious implications for both the individual tester and the station. Who better to ask for guidance than Colin Gibson from the Vehicle Inspectorate? Colin, to me it seems very simple why you should fail a car for corrosion. It's stay on the right side of caution? No, not really. What they would have to do is to, first of all to look at how bad the corrosion is and then look whereabouts on the vehicle it is. The two important things that a tester must know are first of all the definition of excessive corrosion, what it means, and secondly, whereabouts on the vehicle the critical areas are. And how close does a tester need to look? First of all, it's difficult to come up with really hard and fast rules, but the best advice I can give is to have as good a look as it's possible to have, bearing in mind that you can't actually do any dismantling of the vehicle. For example, if you've got a boot with certain items of luggage in, move the luggage to one side, lift the carpet, and have a good look at everywhere that you can see. There will be bits like there where you can't actually take away the carpet or the covering. In that case, you give it as good a squeeze as possible. So, Colin, what about this? Now, with this particular vehicle, the seats are down, the back's full of luggage. You, there are several parts that you can't actually do an examination of, so the tester would refuse to test it. How to find excessive corrosion and how to define it once you've seen it is listed in the manual in detail, but I'll just go through the basic rules. First of all, you look for the corrosion. If you see it, then you need to back that up. If you've got a hole, then it's obviously excessively corroded. If there isn't, if you've just got surface corrosion, feel with your finger and thumb. You'll certainly need to do that in areas that you can't see, for example, under carpets. In other areas, you might need to use the corrosion assessment tool, and we'll talk about how to use that properly later on. So that's how you find corrosion. You then need to define it. If it's crumbled away to form a hole, you've definitely got excessive corrosion and there is no doubt about it. It's not just holes caused by excessive corrosion, but also if the panel is significantly weakened or doesn't feel rigid, either way it would mean a failure. If the tester is in doubt, he should consult the tester's manual. He should record the defect found on the check sheet and pass the vehicle. There are three ways a vehicle can fail its MOT because of excessive corrosion. In a prescribed area where there could be significant weakening or holes, on a load-bearing member that could affect steering and braking, and any outer extremities of the vehicle that could cause injury to pedestrians or cyclists. With the vehicle's extremities, the issue is not the strength of the structure, it's the sharpness of an edge that could cause an injury. Now, although this is obviously very sharp, because of its position, it would not attract a failure. Now look at this. Somebody brushing past this obviously would be causing an injury, hence it would warrant a failure. Remember that as well as corrosion, sharp edges caused by body damage can mean failure too. If the tester is not sure of, of the level of corrosion at the time, <clears throat> then he should give the benefit of doubt to the customer and note this on the check sheet. He would record that for any future complaints that should arise following the, uh, the issue of that test certificate. 
and it is a record as far as he's concerned that he has actually noted that particular area of corrosion and that it's placed on record and at the time he tested it he made a judgment that in his view it was satisfactory. Colin, prescribed areas can cause some confusion. Can you throw some light on it for us? Yeah, basically what a prescribed area is, it's a part of the vehicle structure to which some important components are mounted. And they're very specific and they're listed under the different sections of the manual. You'll find prescribed areas around the mountings for steering and suspension components, around mountings for the braking system components and also for the seat belt anchorages. So does this apply to all vehicles? Yes, it does. The same rules apply, although you've got different types of construction for vehicles. You've got vehicles like this that are monocoque or without a separate chassis. And you've got other vehicles with a, a separate chassis with a body bolted to it. The same rules apply, but we interpret them slightly differently. On a monocoque construction type vehicle, defining where a prescribed area is is quite simple, really. All a tester needs to do is to imagine a bare body shell, like this. This is a typical prescribed area that you'll find on a lot of vehicles that are fitted with McPherson strut suspension. Now the McPherson strut mounts through the centre there, but we're not looking at the centre of that area where we're defining the prescribed area. We're looking at the mounting points which are there and there. Now the prescribed area is defined as an area within 30 centimetres of any of these mounting points. So what you've got in effect is a 30 centimetre radius ball on the body shell. Now we've actually painted this one in white to illustrate how far it extends for this particular type of suspension. So if there was a tiny corrosion hole just there, is that a pass or a fail? Well, you've got a corroded hole which is excessive corrosion. It's inside a prescribed area. Yes, it would have to fail. Well, on vehicles that have a separate body and chassis, you might have, for example, suspension anchorages on the chassis, so the prescribed areas for them would be on the chassis alone, not on the body. And you might have, for example, seatbelt anchorages on the body, so the prescribed areas for those seatbelt anchorages would be on the body and they wouldn't extend down to the chassis. With a vehicle like this, you can see that the hole that's caused by corrosion is in the body, whereas the prescribed area for the suspension is on the chassis. Now, because the body and the chassis are separate, you wouldn't include that hole when assessing the prescribed area on the chassis. So, back on the monocoque. What we've got is, again, the bare body shell. Now, in real life, there'd be headlamps, there'd be all sorts of things attached to that, so the tester wouldn't be able to see as much as this. But to illustrate the point, We've shown it on this. Now there you've got the subframe mounting point just there. So everything within 30 centimetres of that in a sphere is prescribed area. So that's where a tester should look to see if there's any severe corrosion or excessive corrosion. Moving on from that, we've then got uh, a circle of dots there, which are to show where the prescribed area is for the brake servo mounting, which is mounted on that bulkhead. So any excessive corrosion in there would be a reason for ejection. Now moving on from that, the next subject that we would deal with is seatbelt anchorages. Seatbelt anchorage prescribed areas are normally difficult to examine because they're covered with carpet or, or even panelling. In this one, for example, we've got the retracting mechanism that's mounted just there. So anything within 30 centimetres of that is prescribed area for this. We've also got the anchorage point, which is there. So anything within 30 centimetres of that is also a prescribed area. Now, this prescribed area would extend along the floor and along the inner sill. It would also extend up the door pillar and also the outer sill. So you would need to imagine where that would centre on the outer sill and where the 30 centimetre circle would go. On the inside, what you would have to do, because it's covered in carpet, if you can't lift the carpet, you would have to press it hard with your fingers and listen for any signs of rust or if the panel was no longer rigid. So to sum up, if there's a corrosive hole of any size within a prescribed area, it's a failure and you must let the customer know. Yes, that's right. So what about corrosion outside of a prescribed area? Well, that's where it gets a little bit more difficult for a tester because if you've got excessive corrosion inside a prescribed area, 
it's, there's no real decision to be made, the test has got to fail it. Once you move outside of a prescribed area, then it becomes a matter of the tester's opinion. Now, the manual helps us with this because at the back of the manual, in Appendix C, there are diagrams showing different types of constructed vehicles and it shows you the main load bearing members shaded in grey. Now, that's where you're looking outside of prescribed areas. Now, if the, in the tester's opinion, excessive corrosion on one of those main load bearing structural members is so advanced that it's likely to affect either the braking system or the steering gear while the vehicle is being driven in all sorts of road conditions while it's full of passengers then the tester should fail it. If on the other hand the tester's in doubt as to whether the corrosion is quite that bad then he's got the option of advising the customer on an advisory document and passing it. Colin you mentioned the cat tool earlier now firstly why do you use it and secondly how do you use it? Well, first of all, the reason why we use it is because it's necessary to have something that can expose corrosion without causing damage to a vehicle that isn't corroded. And this tool has been designed for specifically that purpose. What used to happen before we had the, this tool is that people would use unauthorised implements, for example, this screwdriver or any of these hammers. And using any of these things, you could actually cause damage to a vehicle in good condition, like this one. Going on to the use of the corrosion assessment tool, you've got the flat end there and use that to listen to changes in sound that might be caused by body filler. Now the other end, the curved end, you would use that to expose areas that you'd seen were corroded, so you'd hit them with that. And that would possibly cause it to crumble away to form a hole. The third part of it, the spade end on the handle, that's used for scraping surface dirt off brake pipes, for example. What a tester must never, ever do is use the corrosion assessment tool like this against bodywork, because that can cause damage. So, Colin, tell us about different methods of repair. Well, when you're repairing prescribed areas, the areas that are critical on the vehicle, the only acceptable method of repair is a continuous seam weld. If you're replacing a complete panel, you can, or the repairer can use spot welds where the manufacturer originally had spot welds. But if it's a patch repair, in other words, it's not a complete panel, then the only acceptable repair is a continuous seam weld. And uh, when it's brought in for the test, it's up to the tester to assess the quality of the repair at the time when it's tested. It's important that the tester always looks at it to make sure that the repair is as strong or virtually as strong as the original structure. The tester should make his assessment of all repairs, regardless of how old they are, even if they've been wrongly assessed in previous tests. So what about the concealment of repairs with the plastic filling? Well, the use of any sort of plastics, whether it be body filler, fibreglass or something like that is not acceptable to replace areas of corroded or damaged metal. It's common practice, having said that, for the repairer to cover a body repair with that as a cosmetic medium, having done a good welded repair underneath it. Now if a tester comes across that, the only way that it can do is assess it as normal and if by using the methods of inspection available to them, they can't determine that it's excessively corroded under the metal. They would have to assume that the material underneath was sound, just a cosmetic repair. And does the same apply to subframes, if it's been undersealed or whatever? Yeah, if, if you've got a repair that's been undersealed, if, whether it be a subframe or the vehicle structure, then the tester can't start scraping off the, the underseal. What they've got to do is to make the best possible assessment of it at the time of the inspection. Can you actually repair a subframe? Yes, you can. The only real way to repair a subframe is to do a continuous seam weld because it's considered to be a suspension component. Having said that, there are the majority of steering and suspension components that you can't actually do any sort of repair on. Things like McPherson strut casings and trailing arms on suspension arrangements. 
but some frames repairs are acceptable. But again, it's up to the tester to make sure that the repair is virtually as strong as the original subframe would have been. There are three things that will help the tester to do the test. Three rules. The first one is that the test doesn't involve any stripping or dismantling and they must not cause any unnecessary damage to the vehicle. So they use the eye, the finger and thumb and the corrosion assessment tool. That's the first one. The second one is that the decision must be based on the direct observation that they've made using those methods and not by making any assumptions. No assumptions must be made. Finally, the test only applies to the condition of the vehicle at the time that the test is done and not at any future date. We will accept complaints involving corrosion up to three months following the issue of a test certificate. At the end, the, the inspectorate, if it has to get into disciplinary action, has got to prove that that vehicle was in that condition at the time the test certificate was issued. The Vehicle Inspectorate knows that the job of a tester is not an easy one. It takes skill and practice to get it right. The manual, with its periodic amendments and special notices, is there to be remembered and referred to. And your local vehicle examiner is there to contact to help us all with advice about rotten cars. <laughs>